Hello and welcome everybody. I don't want to say good morning or good afternoon or good evening because I know there are people logging in from all over the world. So, but welcome and we're very happy to see everyone logging in. And I'm Gustavo Tolosa and today as every Thursday we have live with Dr. McDougall. But as you know, the second Thursday of each month we have our special guest, Dr. Doug Lyle. I know that a lot of you know him and you know how uh, wonderful his lectures are. We can sit and listen to him for hours. Um, I just want to say a few words for those of you that are new here, that Dr. Lyle is the psychologist for the McDougall Wellness Program and for True North Health Center, both in Santa Rosa, California. And Dr. Lyle has lectured at Stanford, Cornell, and other universities, and is the co-author of The Pleasure Trap. And um, he is also the founder of a um, program that is called Esteem Dynamics. And you can visit this wonderful website at esteemdynamics.org, which we will type for you in the chat box. And um, Dr. Lyle has a website where you can get more information about these ideas. And also you can have, you can schedule phone uh, consultations with him. And that is the website, esteemdynamics.org. And you can also reach him directly by email at drdouglyle at yahoo.com and I will type that in the chat box. So we want to welcome you, Dr. Lyle. How are you doing today? Good, good to see you, Gustavo. Very good, good to see you. And today we have a treat uh, for a lot of people. This is going to be the first time that they hear this, uh, con this uh, presentation. And um, let's get going then. Are, you, are we ready? I'm ready to go, let's go. All right, very good. So we're going to use this uh, wonderful technology that we have at our, at our fingertips and get started with the uh, PowerPoint presentation. Let me make sure that is, Dr. Lyle, that is set correctly. Ah, okay, okay, here we go. Excellent. Okay, folks. Um, this is called the condition cram, and I believe that this is uh, going to be an extremely useful idea to understand this for people that to do one of two things. Number one, binge eating. I believe that this is going to be a, a major key to understanding binge eating disorder. And also just general overeating. A lot of people that become the McDougal direction or whole natural foods direction uh, do quite well for a lot of their day. And then very often in the evening, they will eat a lot of calories, uh, maybe at dinner or right after dinner uh, in a couple, two or three hours uh, post dinner. It doesn't have to work that way in that pattern, but it very typically does. And so a lot of people are sitting on an extra 10, 20, 30, even 40 pounds or whatever it is uh, that they that they are struggling with. It's not uncommon for us to hear that people might have been 100 pounds when they started. They've lost 50 or 60 pounds. They're doing quite well, but they've stalled. And one of the reasons that they stall, I believe, is because of what I call a condition cramp. So we're going to now understand something that we have not explored before. Uh, and so we're going to go on a story to, to uh, get this clear. So everybody knows what all this is about here, these pictures, but we'll go on to the next picture. Go ahead, Gustavo, send me the next slide. All right. So this begins with a story of the different types of animals. Uh, this is obviously in Australia. I don't know what big cats are on Australia. Somebody could tell me. But that's a koala bear up there eating eucalyptus leaves, obviously. Now, if you're, uh, uh, the, there's three types of animals with respect to food. There's going to be herbivores, carnivores, and omnivores. And if you're a koala bear and you're an herbivore, obviously, you wake up in the eucalyptus tree and you just start eating and you are surrounded by food. And that's going to be the same thing if you're some Thompson's gazelle on the African savanna, you wake up in the morning and you are surrounded by food. And so for many herbivores, getting enough food is simply not an issue at all. Uh, food is kind of uh, almost uninteresting. It, it's just everywhere. And so you just get busy chomping away and chomping away and you're going to chomp all day long. That's uh, not an uncommon uh, situation for an herbivore. If you're a carnivore, your relationship to food is completely different. 
So uh, with carnivores, food is not all around you. It's in fact scarce. Uh, you have to, it's very difficult to run these herbivores down and to get them. And they're well defended against you. They can hear you coming. They can smell you coming. They can see you coming. Uh, they can feel you coming in just like literally in vibrations in the ground. And they are, they are designed by nature to escape you. And so your job is to try to pick off the young, the sick, the slow, the isolated, or the injured in one way or another. Now, the big cats, for example, in Africa, well, typically, uh, they're, they're very unsuccessful as hunters. They only, they only uh, are succeed about one out of 10 serious attempts at trying to run another animal down. Uh, that's enough for them to eat, but they only eat about once a week on average. So that means it's not uncommon for them to go uh, longer than a week, week and a half or even two weeks uh, between meals. So you can imagine that when they do make a kill, they cram it in. They get every bit of it that they can uh, get uh, down their billets. And so this is a very different relationship to food uh, than is going to be true in a typical herbivore. So you can imagine then that omnivores are going to be somewhere in the middle. That sometimes they're going to be behaving like herbivores, sort of chewing away at low calorie density food. And then once in a while, they're going to get into richer food and they're going to get very excited about it. And when they do, you can expect that they're gonna cram it in if it's available. So uh, when we look at this, this looks an awful lot like uh, how human behavior would be. And in fact, how we know human behavior was. We've had as many as 175 hunter-gatherer um, tribes under observation in the last 50 years by anthropologists. And what we have found is that the pattern of behavior is for a large amount of the calories are going to be eaten. Uh, a significant amount are going to be raw. They're also going to be eating cooked tubers or the starches uh, late in the day as the, the, the woman folk typically, uh, it's their job to make sure that, the, that their, their family survives uh, by digging for tubers or doing whatever it is that they're going to do to get a hold of starches. Uh, those starches are going to need to be cooked and those are going to be the mainstay of those people's survival. However, the men are gonna be out hunting typically and uh, they hunt communally, so they hunt as a group. The, the women's gathering of food is actually very capitalistic. In other words, women gather their own food for their own uh, tent, for their children and their man. But when the men are participating in hunting, that tends to be a communistic activity. In other words, they are all joined in together and that whatever is killed at the end of the day it is divided up among the people in the tribe. This is a very typical pattern uh, for human nature. So uh, this animal food is going to be typically the richest food uh, that humans are going to eat. Now, there are other sources of rich food. There's nuts and seeds, but they're not going to get very many of those. There's also honey uh, that they occasionally will find. Uh, and Richard Wrangham at Harvard has told us that, that honey may have been a fairly substantial caloric resource uh, 400 gatherers, maybe as much as 10% of caloric intake or so. Uh, maybe, maybe not though. So the, uh, the, the main source of rich calories that would have happened, by meaning rich, uh, meaning the very most calorically dense food that people typically would have eaten on a recurrent basis would have been meat. Now I know that my friends in the uh, vegetarian world uh, might raise their eyebrows at, at this observation, but this is in fact what is consistent uh, with what it is that we're observing in, in uh, anthropological studies. So this isn't to say that this is the ideal way to eat, but it's the ideal way to eat if you, if you are facing potential starvation. So our ancestors widened their palate away from just vegetable matter and included hunting as a major calorie resource. And when they did that, uh, the amount of resources that they would get from this, this uh, way of doing things was highly variable. So uh, the herbivore resources, uh, the, herb, uh, the plant resources would have been fairly constant. You just have to go out there and start digging and start chewing. Uh, but the, the animal food would have been hit and miss. And so as a result, what's going to happen is that usually there would be a modest amount of animal food available in any given week. But once in a while, there would be a big kill. And when there would be a big kill, human beings would have crammed. In other words, 
uh, when there would be uh, animal food is typically about 800 calories a pound where the starches are four to 500 calories a pound or so. And the vegetables are 200 and the fruit is 300 and the raw salad greens are 100. So animal food would have been a rich, important source of calories. Uh, and when they got a hold of it, once in a while, they would get a hold of a lot of it. And when they did, it would make sense to cram it. Uh, it's also interesting and consistent with this hypothesis that, that we observe that among the great apes, uh, it's going to turn out that humans are the only great ape that will store substantial amounts of fat. Uh, we're the only great ape that hunts and eats a substantial amount of animal food. This uh, would make sense that if you add a, a major source of variance in your caloric intake was going to be coming from something as capricious as hunting, that it would make sense that you would need to store fat in order to buffer you against the vicissitudes of hunting. And that appears to be exactly uh, what has happened. So keep in mind now that you have a cram circuit and that cram circuit is going to say that if once in a while it turns out that we come across or have access to a rich caloric resource, in this case meat at 800 calories a pound, um, then you should cram it in past normal satiety. Uh, it should be a, a, a relatively rare opportunity and we would then want to force that in past normal comfort zone. Keep in mind also that the modern processed foods are far more calorie dense than 800 calories a pound. So a peanut butter sandwich on, or an, an almond butter sandwich on Ezekiel bread, which may be biochemically very healthy, that is still a 2,000 calorie a pound treat. And so we have to understand that we would be highly motivated to cram in that sort of food uh, past normal satiety. All right, and also keep in mind that we would cram it in, uh, that circuit would be active every day. So whenever there's a, an opportunity to cram in uh, a food of, of its rich, we should be taking advantage of it. That would be the normal instinct uh, that we would expect to reside in human nature. All right, Gustavo, go ahead and give me the next slide. All right, so we're gonna come back to that issue, but first we're gonna visit uh, someone very important. Everybody knows who this is, of course. If you, if you can read Russian, <laughs> this is uh, Ian Pavlov, or Ivan Pavlov. This is the, the famous uh, Russian physiologist who uh, won the Nobel Prize in the early 1900s. Uh, for his discoveries uh, in digestion, uh, digestive process, and particularly with respect to the neurological processes involved in digestion and salivation and all these reflexes, and, and finally, in learning theory. So this is the, the, the father of modern learning theory, and Pavlov uh, came about this actually mostly by accident. He was wanting to study the salivary glands and dogs, and every, but every time he came up to a dog with a plate of food, the dog was already salivating. And so Pavlov couldn't uh, figure out how he was gonna be able to do this and be able to see the initial action. And unfortunately, the, uh, or fortunately, he, he, he knew that he was somehow associated with the food. So he started to try to sneak in the lab very, very quietly, so the dogs wouldn't hear him coming, but the dogs could always hear him coming. And so they always had started salivating before he could get there. Um, he, this, what, this was a major inconvenience to his studies. And he started to consider the possibility that maybe if they associated him with the food, maybe he could get them to associate something else with the food instead. And so he uh, started to ring a bell while he presented them with food. And he came up upon what we now know as classical conditioning which is one of the most important studies or most important discoveries uh, in history of all science. So we're going to look at the next slide, Gustavo, as we're going to learn about classical conditioning. Okay, so don't be afraid. This takes us to a math class. This is a, an, an XY axis where the Y axis is the axis that goes up and down. And at the top, we, we're going to label that salivation. And the bottom axis, the one that goes from zero out to the right, that's called the x-axis. And what we're going to record there is conditioning trials. And so we're going to see every time we present the dog with food and we ring the bell, we're going to see what happens to the dog's salivation. 
and we see that the very first time that we ring the bell and present the dog with food, that there's no particular salivation because the dog doesn't know that the bell means anything. So we can see from this graph at the very first trial that our little dog there is not salivating because this is the first time he's heard the bell. And so therefore he does not know that the bell is associated with food. But we see that the second time um, he can uh, start to associate this. And so he's salivating a little bit. And as we see on succeeding conditioning trials, uh, he's getting the hang of this, that he's essentially uh, associating with the bell with food. And so by the 10th conditioning trial, he now, uh, his, his nervous system effectively has completely associated the bell with food, and therefore he's salivating at a maximum level uh, as he fully anticipates that he's going to be fed uh, by ringing the bell. So this is, uh, as we connect those little dots and, and draw a curve, this is what's known as the learning curve. And uh, the learning curve is used in, uh, to chart out many different types of animal learning, including human learning. Uh, but this is where it started. It started with Pavlov uh, in the late, uh, late 1800s and early 1900s. Okay, so we're going to skip forward about uh, 80 years now, and we're going to uh, look at a, another brilliant man, and his name is Shepard Siegel. And he's uh, still alive. He's, a, he's an older uh, professor emeritus, I believe, at McMaster's University in Canada. The, um, this is one of the, the grand figures in learning theory. So let's look at something that he discovers uh, using Pavlovian thinking to solve a, a, a fascinating problem. And the problem that he solves is heroin overdoses. So Siegel is puzzled uh, why heroin overdoses even exist. And uh, that's because heroin users are experienced with, with heroin. And they also, uh, they, heroin is also expensive now in the 1970s and 80s. And so it doesn't make any sense that anybody would overdose. The, uh, when I was a kid thinking about these problems, we would always say, well, you know, somebody gets drugs off the street and they don't know what the percentage is. And so therefore they could, you know, it could be purer than they think it is. So they accidentally overdose. Siegel's thinks, you know, that's ridiculous. Uh, if anything, it's less potent because it's so expensive that they're going to cheat and they're going to fill it with flour and sugar and everything else under the sun. So it does not make sense to him that heroin users uh, would overdose sort of by accident. So now he's going to go on a, a mental quest as he's going to figure this out. So the first thing he thinks about is he thinks about the salivation in Pavlov's dogs and he thinks about this and he thinks, you know what, let's not call this, Pavlov called the salivation a reflex. And he says, you know, let's not think about this as a reflex. Let's think about it as what we're going to call a compensatory response. So if you think about the organism being in a state of homeostasis, uh, that anything that you do to it shoves it out of homeostasis and it's to want to shove its way back. And so food will shove that dog out of homeostasis. And so the system is getting ready or preparing itself to shove itself back to homeostasis by getting ready to digest food. And so, so far that just seems like a relabeling of, of, a, of, a, of an idea. So we're, instead of changing things from a reflex, uh, we're calling it a compensatory response, but pretty soon this is going to open up new thinking in conditioning theory that's gonna be very important. So for example, let's suppose that you work in a cooler. Um, and so the, your first day in there, you've got your parka, and you've got your hat and you've got your gloves. You go in there and you work all day and it's 24 degrees in that cooler. So the next day that you come to work, what's gonna happen is, is that as you're in the parking lot, walking your way into work, your temperature, your body temperature is gonna to start to rise a little bit because it's anticipating that it's gonna face the cold. The third day, it's gonna happen again. And the fourth day, it's gonna happen again. And you will go up a Pavlovian learning curve whereby you've been there two or three weeks, and when you're in the parking lot, your, your hands are getting very warm even before you even enter the building. That is Pavlovian conditioning, and this is not a reflex. This is a compensatory response. Your body is getting ready for the shock of this, and it's preparing in advance. 
Uh, this is where you see these these old guys up in the I don't know in the Alps that jump in these mountain lakes that are freezing. <laughs> now we know why they can do it. They've been doing it every day of their lives, and they essentially have a conditioned compensatory response. That as they're walking out there towards the water, their body temperature is already rising and preparing for the shock. So this is uh, a little bit useful. So now we're going to use this to think about addiction process. So a heroin user, the first time they use it, it blows the system away. It rocks them completely out of homeostasis. And the nervous system basically realizes we can't have that happen. That's, that's a bad thing. So the next time they use, the system is already engineering a compensatory response. Literally, uh, biochemistry is getting ready to neutralize the heroin, and it will. Um, and if you continue to use, the heroin user won't even hardly be able to feel it. So they have to increase their dose. And as they increase their dose, then the compensatory response is going to be in, is increasing. So this winds up being an arms race between the increased drug, uh, drug use and the compensatory response. And you can get to a point where the compensatory response is extreme. The system is extremely well defended uh, against whatever this is, whether it's alcohol, heroin, or anything else under the sun. And so uh, now an interesting thing will happen. Suppose that the heroin users in their in their room at night and they're fiddling around with their little spoon and their and their needle or however it works. And then you can imagine that that let's suppose that they thought they had some heroin, but they don't. So now what we have is the compensatory response is very large and is being raised in the organism preparing for this. But with there's no heroin to meet it. So what's going to happen is the organism is going to be in a very uncomfortable state. And that uncomfortable state, uh, the conditioned compensatory response, Shepard Siegel says that response is what we call craving. So cravings, uh, as, as would later be shown by later research, cravings are significantly, a great deal of what craving is, is nothing other than a conditioned compensatory response. So now Siegel is going to go on. So for example, with the dog um, salivating, if we call that a conditioned compensatory response, we realize that if we ring that little bell and don't feed the dog, that dog is going to be craving the food uh, because his comp conditioned compensatory response makes life uncomfortable for him uh, because it's disturbing his neurochemistry and it won't settle down until the food meets it. Now, uh, we're going to go on because Siegel is now going to uh, essentially solve a mystery. And that is, suppose that you are, you've been using heroin and you have a major condition compensatory response to defend yourself against it. And let, let's suppose that you typically use at night in your room under dark conditions. And then it turns out that, you know, one morning you get up and you go to hit the streets and um, it turns out you run into some friend and he says, hey, I've just got some heroin. You want to go use it in, a, in my car? And you do this but you were not ready for this in this different uh, set of situations. So as a result, you do not activate the condition compensatory response. And when you use a normal amount of heroin for you with no conditioned response to defend you, you can die. And so this is, uh, this is an extraordinary discovery by Shepard Siegel. Uh, he thought this thing through conceptually, and then he tested it in the laboratory with rats and it, it works perfectly. This is exactly what happens. He conditioned a set of rats for 30 days to heroin, and then he put them under different conditions, uh, different lighting and sound, or however it is that he did it. I, I forgot how he did it. Uh, but he put them under different conditions, used the same amount of heroin, and the rats died. So this is an extraordinary discovery about the, the potency of conditioned compensatory responses, and also understanding that this is what craving is, and this is how this works. Okay, so now we're gonna look at what's called an extinction curve. So we're gonna go back to our dog, and we've now conditioned our dog that every time we ring the bell, he's having a conditioned compensatory response, he or she. And so we now know that that is what craving is. So the dog is, is craving the food, 
because he is generating uh, an internal biochemical response that uh, essentially is anticipating the food and it's disturbing to not get the food to neutralize that response. And so now what we're gonna do is the very first time, this is now, we've conditioned the dog for, I don't know, a month or two. And now what we're gonna do is we're going to counter condition the dog. So on trial number one of extinction, we're gonna ring the bell, but we're not gonna give him any food. And so we would expect that the craving would be pretty high in those circumstances, and it is, so it's up to over to 10. But now something is gonna happen very interesting. But the second time we hit the bell and don't give him any food, we might expect it to go down a little bit to essentially mirror the learning curve, but that's not what happens. What happens in fact is that the craving goes up. And the third time we ring the bell and don't give the dog food, it goes up some more. So this little bubble that you see at the top of this graph between one through four conditioning trials, this is known as the extinction burst. This is a, a normal feature of animal learning uh, when an animal has been rewarded, that the system essentially throws a tantrum um, where it cannot, it, it expects that it's going to get this resource, but it's not going to get it. And so this is, uh, uh, this is a fascinating characteristic of learning because essentially what this does is it defends the organism against a resource, or in this case, food, which very often would be the resource, the, um, that it, it is expecting to get, that it sh essentially should be getting according to the conditions. Uh, the conditions look like they're perfectly conducive, and it looks like we should be getting food. If we don't get it, then we should fight very hard for it because there's a good chance that the food is very nearby. So I want you to think, for example, of a little bird that lives in some place uh, where there's a river and there's a big bend in the river and one day this bird discovers there's a bunch of worms there and so it eats them like crazy and then the next day it feels a craving for those worms and it comes over there but there's no worms so it comes back over there at a little different time of day and at about four o'clock it wanders over there and sure enough there's a bunch of worms and so the next day it wanders over there at 10 a.m and there's no worms but it has this craving at about four o'clock and it turns out it goes over there and there's the worms again. So it goes up a learning curve that after a while, it figures out that at around four o'clock, there's gonna be worms there. And so it doesn't have a watch, it's just watching the sun. And it doesn't think this thing through consciously like humans, it just feels a craving all of a sudden at that time of day, that it, it might be a couple hundred yards away doing something else, and then suddenly it feels this craving to head back over to that area of the river. And there it is, and there are the worms. And this is, a, this is exactly how the learning system works. Now you can imagine that this goes on for three or four months, and then one day it goes over there at four o'clock and there's no worms. So it's pretty upset. But after a while, the craving goes away. Uh, it searches around for the worms, and it goes away, and it goes about its business. Comes back the next day at the same time, and now the craving is worse. So now it starts scratching around in the mud. It gets its little claws knee deep in the mud because it's determined. The system is basically saying those worms are very likely around here somewhere. So keep looking. Okay. So then what we're going to see is the next day it's going to get even worse. And pretty soon it's going to be digging its little beak down into the mud uh, looking for this. So this is us tearing apart the pantry like, you know, those those uh, vegan Reese's are somewhere in here. <laughs> Where are they? This is, this is the extinction burst. This is the frustration uh, of an animal not wanting to cry uncle on an important resource that, that somehow is now disappearing. So now you can see that over time with succeeding trials that are not reinforced, that this, this system is going to go into extinction. This is simply because of a cost benefit analysis that the brain is running as it's, as it's realizing it appears that the resource is gone. Uh, this is exactly what you would see if there's a bank robbery and there's a silent alarm and so some employee has hit the silent alarm and as the robbers leave the bank, uh, 30 seconds later, the cops show up 
and they say, oh, they're on the street. So they're going to grab everybody they can, throw them up against the wall, because there's a really good chance those resources are still on the street. But half an hour later, they're not. And that's because they're going to realize it's not worth looking for. It looks like they're gone. And this is exactly what extinction is. So over repeated trials, the organism uh, conditioning process will go into extinction. Now that doesn't mean it's gone. It just means it's quiet. Now, the, um, so this is exactly what we're going to go through with cigarette smoking, for example. Uh, we're going to classically condition cigarette smoking. Then what's going to happen is uh, if the person tries to quit, the nicotine withdrawal, the craving, which is a conditioned compensatory response, is going to be pretty acute. And most people will never get past the extinction curve. If they do get past the extinction curve, they're in way better shape after a week or two. And then, unfortunately, out there in the distance somewhere is a little spike. And that little spike is called spontaneous recovery. And that was noticed by Pavlov more than 100 years ago. That for some reason, all of a sudden, out of the blue, there would be some serious cravings would perk up. Now, let's see why this would be. The reason would be if you're that little bird and you've learned about those worms, pretty soon you keep going back and checking, but there's no worms. So it pretty well goes into extinction and the cravings get to be very low. But once in a while, the nervous system ought to kick up some cravings at a higher level. So you might not have checked on those worms for two or three weeks. And then suddenly you're this little bird and suddenly you just get this craving it's not super intense, but it's intense enough for you to go over and fly over to that area and just check. The reason why that would be smart is because if the resources were ever there once, there's a good chance that those resources might come back someday. So you ought to go back and check, and animals do. And so that's called spontaneous recovery. And you can imagine that if that bird goes back and checks and there's worms there, then we know what's going to happen the next day. He's going to be right back there the next day. So he'll be right back up the learning curve, maybe not all the way. The cravings may not be as intense as they were when he had consistently uh, found the worms there, but they're going to be up substantially. So he might be halfway up the learning curve. And if he's not doing anything better that next day, there's a good chance he's going to go back and hit, see if those worms are there the subsequent day. If there aren't any worms there, or if it's not therefore reinforced, then the sub, sub, uh, subsequent spontaneous recovery blips become less and less intense over time. This is why people, um, after 10 years of being dry as an alcoholic, the spontaneous recovery blips are very, very low, and they can actually go into a bar, and someone can pour them their favorite drink right in front of them and start drinking it, and they'll probably be okay. The cravings will be very slight because essentially they have never reinforced the spontaneous recovery. So this is, uh, you can see how dangerous this is in terms of habits that we don't want. Let, let's take a look at this. With respect to um, our problem, what I'm going to argue here, and there's evidence for it, is that human beings were designed by nature to cram because they're a natural omnivore. They would have crammed only the rich food. They're not gonna cram grapes. I don't know people that are cramming grapes after dinner. Uh, that's not typically what people cram. People are cramming processed foods that are above 500 calories a pound. There are a few people that might actually cram even potatoes. Uh, that's possible. Uh, there's uh, rare binge eaters out there that will do so. And, and this is what's going on. Now, uh, but most people, when they cram, they're cramming richer foods after dinner. And the reason why they're doing this is because they have an instinct that tells them that that's one of the most useful things that they could do to ensure their survival. This would not have been a problem in the Stone Age when you would have occasionally gotten access to rich foods and once in a while you would cram. But here's the problem. Today, if you have access to them every day and you cram every day, then you condition the cram. So what's gonna happen is, is that you actually go up a learning curve and you wind up with, guess what? Cravings for cramming, even after you're full. And in fact, it is most likely that the most uh, reliable conditioning cue that would tell you that it's time to cram 
will not be a bell. It will be your own distended stomach. So your own distended stomach winds up being a very good predictor of, of the fact that we are going to be eating some more in a while because that's the two things that run together. So as a result, literally in a cruel twist of fate, your own satiety mechanisms being full winds up being a conditioning cue to tell you that you're probably going to be cramming soon. And so this, uh, this is a strange set of affairs, uh, very, uh, you know, very problematic, obviously, to, to get out of this uh, if you didn't know what you were looking at. Now, people have heard this talk now a couple of times uh, in different places, and they, they say, oh, my God, you know, what are we going to do about this? Well, look, the, the truth is, is that the, the difficulty of getting through an extinction burst and getting any kind of conditioning process to extinction depends upon the potency of the substance that we're talking about. And so if we're talking about uh, morphine or heroin, it's exceedingly difficult to get through the extinction curve. The, the cravings are extraordinarily intense and, and painful. Um, if we're talking about alcohol, it's also very hard. It's not as hard as uh, morphine, morphine and heroin, but it is extraordinarily difficult extinction burst to get through alcohol. Um, doable, but hard. Okay. The, then we go down the food chain to cigarettes. Cigarettes are pretty hard. They're not, they're not as hard as alcohol, but they're pretty hard. And uh, we see that the cost benefit of smoking changed dramatically when we made people go outside. So they smoke in a high rise building in 1985. Well, they can't smoke in a high rise building by the year 2000. And so it winds up not being worth the trouble to actually go down the elevator, go outside, hang out with other smokers for 10 or 15 minutes and then come back in and go up to your office. It's just not worth the trouble. And so as a result, the cost benefit analysis wound up uh, essentially teasing people away from cigarettes and they were able to get through their withdrawal processes and quit. Now, I would submit that a conditioned cram circuit is probably about one fourth as intense as, as uh, cigarettes. In other words, that it's just, in, just intense enough, like you'll feel it and if, if this is something that you've been doing, you the first few nights you will be a little bit frustrated and you will be wanting to cram and it will just seem like a good idea. And after all, the food's healthy that you're planning on cramming on. You're planning on cramming on air pop popcorn. Uh, what's wrong with that? And the answer is biochemically nothing. But the problem is that's this cramming is what's responsible for people being overweight. The, uh, it's not the calorie density of their general diet. It's what's happening after they're already full and they're cramming in some extra food repetitively and they crave it if they don't get it. So you've got to get through the extinction burst. And not only that, you have to watch out for spontaneous recoveries that will also someday just feel like a good idea to cram. Now, this helped me understand um, something that always puzzled me in the McDougall program. And that is people would go away and tell me they did great for eight months. They'd come in March and they would do great until Thanksgiving. And then Thanksgiving, all the wheels came off. And I was puzzled for years by this because the, the notion was they got into rich food and then they rediscovered the taste for it and then they went crazy. The problem is, is that the taste neuroadaptation problem is not that capricious. One bite won't, won't get you completely off the rails. But the cram circuit is going to be different. So at Thanksgiving, um, you know, the taste neuroadaptation takes a while, it takes repetitive administrations over you know a couple of three weeks to adulterate your taste buds and it's the same way it takes you a few weeks to recover uh from in being in trouble and to get out of the pleasure trap that's a tough problem but there's a different issue here with respect to the cram circuit this is pavlovian learning and so if you if it's in extinction it's not gone it is it's quickly and easily recovered as alcoholics know literally one drink can put them in serious trouble and, um, and in the same way, I believe that what happens with people with the cram circuit is if they get in a very healthy groove and they're doing a great job and they're not cramming for whatever reason, then when they go to Thanksgiving, they'll cram on Thursday night and then they'll cram on, 
on Friday night, and then they're going to cram on Saturday. In other words, we can have a whole weekend of cramming. So what's happening is, is we're very quickly going back up the learning curve, fully conditioning the organism. And now they're going to have to face an extinction burst and, a, and an extinction process again. And a lot of times they don't because they're demoralized and that they can't, they can't manage to uh, stay out of the sauce for long enough. So this is now, we now have an understanding of what it is that we're up against and a, a, a greater respect for it. Uh, it's not that intimidating, but it is, it's a challenge and you have to know that it's in front of you. This is um, uh, for you know, my career the last 20 years after Alan Goldhammer dragged me into this uh, arena of the world has been about, it's been a, a crusade to essentially argue against the status quo in our field when it comes to weight and weight management. So people are told they've got psychological problems. People are told that they've had bad things happen to them in their childhood. That's why they're you know, eating away their pain. Uh, they're told that the reason why they're, they're eating a bunch of junk in the present is because they've got stress. In other words, there's all kinds of psychobabble about this. And my crusade has been to say, no, there's nothing wrong with you. And what you're doing is completely rational. And it just seems like you're really frustrated because if you're 30 or 40 pounds overweight and it's having big consequences, um, it seems like there's these big bad consequences, which means there must have been a big bad problem to cause this. And there isn't, uh, not inside you. The problem's in your environment. Uh, the environment is now so strikingly different than the environment that you were designed for that you are essentially set up to walk right into this trap. And this is all of the features in science when we're trying to explain a, 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 some phenomenon. There's a concept called proportion of variance explained or essentially in lay terms, what are all the factors and how much of the, of the question do they answer? So when it comes to heart disease, you know, we could say, oh, well, if you grow up in Los Angeles, you're going to have heart disease because there's a lot of stress on the freeways and there's some smog, too. So that that could hurt you. Well, it turns out that those are fact, those are non factors. Uh, if there's any if there's any explanatory power, it's less than one percent. The if we're going to try to understand heart disease, we're going to look at smoking and we're going to look at animal food. Those two things are going to be the things that essentially predict or are responsible for the largest share of the explanation. Uh, if we're going to try to understand why people are in trouble with respect to their diets and that they overeat and they struggle with their weight uh, or that they binge eat, we're going to start with the pleasure trap, which is the fact that really rich food tastes better than food that is not as rich. That is a biological fact across all species. And we have now created magic food, superfood, that is overwhelming the system in combinations that it was never designed to have. So sugar and fat in high quantities never exist in nature. And sugar and salt uh, don't exist side by side in nature. And fat and salt don't exist side by side in nature. So when you have a chocolate shake, you are having sugar and fat in high quantities. That, that never took place. And so you're essentially double dosing the pleasure pathways the pleasure trap all by itself is a huge explanation of the problem. Energy conservation, uh, the notion that animals are designed by nature to take every shortcut possible, uh, this explains a great deal as well. So you could just go through a drive through and all the prepared foods are really rich uh, and really available and pretty cheap. And so as a result, natural healthy food is comparatively high energy expenditure to try to get to it. And so that's a problem. The, uh, now, if that weren't enough, we also have social pressure. So we are a highly social creature. And so we are uh, essentially built to be sensitive to this. That would be enough. A fourth problem that I've talked about in the last few years is what I call the ego trap. And that is that if we've got a goal that's, that's really hard and it's harder than we appreciate, then when we fail, we just kick over the table and quit. And that's something that we have to struggle against with respect to healthy living, healthy diet. So those four things are enough. But then we're going to add something else. We're going to now add the fact that we now can understand that human beings naturally will cram rich foods. And that the rich foods aren't just rich. They're richer than the cramming food of our natural history. 
that peanut butter sandwich is 2,000 calories a pound. It's two and a half times as concentrated as the meat that the cram circuit was designed around. And so when we have crackers and veggie chips and things of this nature uh, hanging around the house, you can better believe that people are going to circle back around after dinner and they're going to cram in another few hundred calories because the nervous system is going to believe that that's one of the smartest things that they could possibly do. And then the problem is, is once it's conditioned, then even when you try to stop, you have cravings and you have to face an extinction burst at the top of that withdrawal process. And that will beat people up. And then even if you get through that, there's going to be spontaneous recovery moments where if you reinforce them, then it puts you back up the learning curve. When you actually look at all of the features of how it is that this works, it's literally the devil himself couldn't have put together a better set of forces to actually keep us in this trap. You know, when I looked at it and uh, Alan Goldhammer and I sat down and listed this all out, we were just shaking our heads like, well, no wonder this is so hard. It's a miracle how well how many people do. And, um, and we looked at this and we thought, you know, this is amazing that there are so many of these forces. And of course there are. These forces, the pleasure trap, energy conservation, social pressure in particular, the cram circuit, extinction burst, and spontaneous recovery, these are all engineered by your biology to make sure that you don't starve to death in an environment of scarcity. And so, of course, they are brilliantly engineered, except that they're now working against you. And so once we understand this, uh, we can quit, quit beating ourselves up overthinking that there's something wrong with us that we're struggling. Now, are emotional issues on the table? Maybe they are. And I'm willing to keep an open mind about any individual's case and, and where their emotional history might play a factor. But remember, whatever factors that they play, we must subtract out the proportionate variance that is being explained by these other seven factors first. Okay. And then we can talk about that. And I think that we can, we can easily see that if we look at the behavior of animals, we're going to find that these other factors are dominating the show. Uh, and almost the last slide. If we want to look at just the potency of just the pleasure trap, this is an experiment that was done in um, about 2009. So this was done about six years after Alan and I published the pleasure trap. And it's too bad. Uh, that they did this. This would have been a beautiful study to talk about in the book. The, um, this is a bunch of rats, and what the experimenters did was they fed them healthy rat chow, which they were used to, and then one day they decided, we're going to feed you standard, the standard American diet. So cheeseburgers, french fries, chocolate shakes, whatever. They threw this stuff in the rat cage for a month, and the rats ate all they wanted. And you can imagine what happened. There was very excited rats starting to get overweight in a heck of a hurry. Uh, at the end of that month, what they did was they took the, that chow out and they put their healthy rat chow back in. And what happened was fascinating. They watched these rats carefully. The average rat refused to eat for 14 days. They were totally on strike. They were basically like, no, we're not going to eat this food that is of lower calorie density. Forget it. In fact, on very close videotape analysis, you can see one of the rats giving a gesture <laughs> to, to the experimenter. The, uh, this, is, uh, this is telling you just the force involved with one, number one of those eight uh, explanations. So keep in mind that, that we have a, uh, if you're struggling, we've got a formidable set of forces that we have to master. You can do it. Very often people have done pieces of it for a while. Sometimes they put it all together for a while. Now I think with an understanding that some of your after dinner cravings are classically conditioned and they will pass. Get yourself distracted for an hour. Go for a walk. Play ping pong. I don't care what you do, but don't give in. Once you have finished your healthy dinner, walk away from that table. And uh, if you do this repetitively for several nights in a row, uh, your nervous system will fight you for a while but then you'll get uh, the inner peace that will come and it won't bother you. This folks is how we get the life we deserve. Uh, this is the life you deserve. You are, you are close. Many of you have 
put 75% of this puzzle together and you've done a very good job in stretches. Uh, this is, I believe, is the last mile that many people need. Uh, and it is also the answer to people that binge. Uh, people that are binging are in fact classically conditioned to the binge. So the distended stomach is actually signaling the craving for additional eating. Uh, we must do exactly the same thing that I'm talking about. And if you grit your teeth and get yourself through the extinction burst, you can find relief and peace uh, away from this problem. Thank okay. you, Dr. Lyle. Very good. And ladies and gentlemen, do you all agree with me that Dr. Lyle is the genius, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. So but now all of this lecture that you did today, that is not included or, or is it in the book, The Pleasure Trap? No. No, this is okay. uh, new information that we just put together over this last year. And so uh, this is, we presented this at AJ's uh, Shindig in Las Vegas. And I just presented this at the McDougal three-day program. And so we're just getting this out. And so this webinar was important to uh, bring this to, to the McDougal world. Yes, yes. And, and of course, everybody uh, remember that this webinar that you just watched is always, these webinars are re, uh, recorded. So you can watch it as many times as you want. It's going to be posted tomorrow afternoon or evening on Dr. McDougall's website under the webinar page. Uh, Dr. Lyle, would you con um, just maybe, we have like four minutes or five minutes, uh, answer a couple of questions. If, if we got a quick one, go ahead. Okay. All right, this, uh, let's just do one, and then maybe next month we could pick up the same topic, but with questions then. So yes. everybody, if you don't mind emailing your questions to webinar at drmcdougall.com and put on the subject line uh, the cramp circuit um, then, or Dr. Lai or something like that, so we know that it's for questions. So there is a question here that says, um, does everyone cram or is this seen mostly on overweight people and dieters? I have never seen my husband or child or children overeat or eat at night. Yes. Um, I don't think it's, it's not just overweight people. It's uh, so I think this is just a it, it, individual differences. Can people can wander into this? I have very often crammed in stretches uh, for whatever reasons. So, my my, uh, my carrot cake cramming period <laughs> is well known, and there's been other such uh, there's been other such cramming periods. So I didn't actually know uh, what was happening uh, at the time. So uh, this is, but it, it for for me it happens to go in stretches, and then some little thing will change in my life circumstances, and I'll get away from it. And right. so it's not a it's, this isn't this isn't morphine. It's it's not even cigarettes. It's it's but what it is is it's a mild. You would almost call it a habit. But if you called it a habit, you would not actually learn the important message, which is that you're designed by nature to honor your cravings, and those cravings are are a message uh, that has been that is essentially programmed into you in this case by a cram circuit that is being indulged repeatedly in a way that the cram circuit of our ancestors was never indulged repeatedly. So that craving is something that you are naturally gonna honor unless you know that it's there and that, that it's bogus. So this is not the same thing, uh, by the way, as <clears throat> um, what do you call it? Weighing and measuring and portion control. You can see why these ideas over the last 20 years <clears throat> have had popularity. Because accidentally, people using these things or intermittent fasting, uh, you can see that, that these ideas have accidentally sometimes kicked people out uh, of, a, of a conditioned cram circuit. So now that we understand the problem better, we don't have to be using some of these measures, which are actually not directly addressing the problem. They're actually accidentally addressing the problem. So uh, this is the this is the correct way of viewing this problem. And uh, so we don't need to be weighing and measuring. That's a, you know, even though people have had success with that, but not because of weighing and measuring is an answer. It's because that has actually caused some people to counter condition their cram circuit. The same thing is true with intermittent fasting. So having little borders on when we eat, I wouldn't have borders on when I eat. You finish dinner, 
when you finish dinner and you are full and you are satisfied, if you want a little treat at the end, have your little treat, whatever it is, you know, and then you get up and you walk away from that table and you do not come back to the kitchen. Okay? Right. That's it. That is the solution. It isn't, it isn't a specific timing window. It's actually counter conditioning this very particular circuit. Right. So Dr. I, one more thing, because I think this is interesting. Uh, someone is saying, uh, a few people are, are mentioning that um, if, if having a, a full stomach is a trigger to eat more, then is the remedy then not to eat until full or just wait until right before we go to bed? Or, or like you said, just walk away and not come no, back? But the, we have to remember, once you counter condition this thing, it's not going to be a problem. You're designed to eat to satiety, and you should eat to satiety, just like we've always said. And you should eat to satiety and healthy food, and then we're not going to have a problem. The only problem we have now is you have a conditioned cram circuit. And that conditioned cram circuit is never supposed to have happened. The, the, the instinct is there to cram, folks. It's there to cram. And so it's there's the, the circuit says... If there's rich fruit in my environment, even when I'm full, I should cram it in. That's not a problem. If you only had rich fruit in your environment once a month, if that, if that was the all it was, then you would never wind up with a classically conditioned circuit because once a month isn't going to condition it. Okay. But if you, every time after you finish your healthy food and you're, you are comfortably full, and then you're able to condition, you're able to cram in a bunch of richer food. If you do that night after night after night, then pretty soon you condition the fact that you are full is a reliable cue that we're going to eat some more. All you have to do is stop that behavior. If you stop that behavior and you do not indulge that craving, then what's going to happen after a short period of time, a week or two, is you're not going to have that craving. It's going to go away. I have right. done that many times. I, I craved um, uh, whole wheat fig newtons for probably six months. Uh, <laughs> I just I crammed these things. I remember I remember this. I was living with Dr. Alan Goldhammer. We were writing the Flusher Draft, and I couldn't understand why I was doing it. And he just said, "Well, you're skinny. You probably just need the calories." <laughs> we didn't know. All right. right. Now I look back on it. Uh, then. I got to move out once we finished the book. That was my, that was our deal. Like <laughs> I had to his roof until it was done. <laughs> so when it was done, I moved out and I moved away from the store that had those things. And so once I moved away from the store, I quit buying them. And when I quit buying them, I quit doing it. So it, the cram, the condition cram circuit drifted away. But for, but for probably a year, uh, I did this because they were in the house and they were there. Yeah. And we didn't think anything of it. They were pretty healthy food. I didn't know what was going on. And so right. now I know there's a conditioned cram circuit. So I've been in, a, in and out of that conditioning process many times. Right, right. <laughs> always, well, always on, you know, good, good, healthy treats or good, healthy, rich food. But it's been it's been an additional cram. No question. That was a processed food, and so someone was mentioning popcorn. And so it's yeah. maybe instead of eating popcorn, you eat the corn on the cob, right? Sure. Yeah, you won't cram corn on the cob. Right. But you will <laughs> definitely cram popcorn. Uh, popcorn is a lot more calories per pound than corn on the cob. Well, thank you, Dr. Lyle. And I know that everybody here uh, will benefit from listening to this uh, webinar a few more times because there was a lot of information to process. And um, so I encourage everybody to watch it, get some really good questions for our next webinar, the second Tuesday of October. And we'll see you then, Dr. Lyle. Fantastic. Great to see you, Gustavo. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye. All right.